Good morning, guys. Uh, thank you, Brian, for that great introduction. If, if you guys are impressed by the fact that I played four years at Colby, then uh, you've never seen Colby play basketball. I, I promise you that. Um, I did not know that that, that was going to be the focus of my uh, introduction. But let me tell you, my name is John Olinto. I am the co-founder of Be Good. Um, I'm really excited to be here, uh, mostly because I really love talking about the company that my best friend and I started almost 13 years ago. Um, it's been a wild experience, and I, I, hope, uh, I hope I do justice with some of these slides about some of the, the things that we've done and how we've taken our business from an idea at a bar one night 13 years ago to a business plan, to working in fast food restaurants to try to figure out the business, to opening a restaurant in Back Bay um, until now where we have 17 restaurants open in six different states. Um, we actually have, a, we've actually kind of built a real business. Um, the things that I want to talk about today first would be telling you about the history of our company. Second, uh, really digging into the brand and the concept and what it means and what, be good, what the mission is and, and what we, what we're, why I'm here and why I still love what I do. Uh, then I want to take you through um, a couple of specific marketing ideas and, and really focused on community building. Um, I think it, it, they're funny, but, but they're great, and, and I, I, get, I get happy just thinking about the chance to tell you guys about it. Uh, then I want to tell you a little bit about the menu and the products that we serve, because right now we're in kind of an evolution of our brand, and I think it's an interesting time, uh, and I think you guys will get something out of that. Uh, close with what the restaurants look like and what they're going to look like in the future, and then ultimately how we're positioned for success in the future. So we'll start with our story. So it's a good story. Um, the story of Be Good is it started about 25 years ago. I met my best friend. This guy really is my best friend. His name's Anthony. We met in the sixth grade. Uh, we were pretty much like every 12-year-old kid. We loved sports. We loved hanging out together. Uh, got into trouble, you know, all the, the normal things. The thing that was different about us is that we actually, even when we were little, we talked about starting a business. In high school, we started this company called AMO Landscaping. It's, you guys have probably heard about it. It's, 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 it's great. It's a great company. We, we, like to, we like to say that it's the greatest landscaping company that never cut anybody's lawn, pulled any weeds. Um, the story is that we, uh, we were in, I think, freshman in high school, and we still have, we still have the flyer hanging in our office. Um, we spent about a week printing on these dot matrix printers flyers, letting everybody know, we'll come out for free and cut your grass. Just call this number. We then go to the South Shore Plaza in Braintree. We spend probably a week every day putting a flyer in every single car windshield we get. We run home to Anthony's house, wait for the phone to ring. Next week, we realize we're never going to get any calls. Anthony put the wrong phone number on the, on the flyer. <laughs> we still have the flyer, and immediately we realized that Anthony wasn't going to be in charge of marketing of any business we ever did. So, you know, I think we do a lot of different things together. Uh, I'm really not the CMO. I just kind of said I was because I, I felt like I, I needed to say that to get in here. Um, <laughs> But I am the co-founder, we, and we, we break up the business in different ways. You know, Anthony does a lot of the finance and the ops, and I do um, a lot of the brand and the marketing and the community stuff. Um, but, but we make an incredible team, and we, kinda, we still do um, a lot of different things for the company. Um, so the story goes like this. We, we go to middle school together. We go to elementary school together. We go to high school. We go to different colleges. We get out of college. We both have uh, kind of similar jobs doing management consulting. Um, which means we travel a lot, but every weekend we still find ourselves on Saturday nights pretty much in the same bars in Austin Brighton doing pretty much the same thing, which is 1 o'clock in the morning comes and we've had one too many and we're in the corner doing the same, having the same conversation about how much, how we failed and how we hadn't started our business and what were we going to do and we can't do consulting because it's, there's, there's no passion in it, right? So one night as we're, we're in that conversation, the girl I was dating at the time walks up and says, this is a true story, she says, if you guys, if you do this anymore, we're done. So that night, Anthony and I looked at each other. We said, tomorrow we start. And the idea was we were going to present business cases once a month to each other um, and do it in, in a real kind of management consulting way. So, you know, create a PowerPoint deck with SWOT analysis and some financial modeling. And we really did this. We did it for about a year. And we came up with the stupidest business ideas in the world. But it forced us to actually make this thing real and to actually pursue something. And, and really, in the end, we, we gave ourselves a deadline. And by the end of about a year of doing this, or maybe about eight months, we kept coming back to this one really well-defined need. Okay, So this is about 13 years ago. 13 years ago, the food that we had grown up on, you know, burgers, fries, salads, all that great stuff, um, 
there was no place to get it, okay? And, and, and it wasn't relevant. The places that we grew up, the food we grew up eating and the places we were, used to get it from, it wasn't relevant to us anymore. We were 25 years old, we had made a little bit more money, and we, couldn't, we didn't feel good about anything we were eating. The, the landscape of fast casual, and that's kind of the category that we participate in, it was made up of truly the mega chain. So it was BK, Mickey D's, Wendy's, um, Taco Bell, and then it was kind of like local kind of independent operators, mostly like pizza places. So the landscape looked much different. So 13 years ago, the idea was pretty clear. We knew that if we could take food, we called it real food, made it naturally, don't process it, serve it for 10 bucks, we felt like we could actually pull that off. Now we had no knowledge, we had no skill, we had never worked in restaurants, but we wanted an idea and we wanted something that we would believe in, that was passionate and that, we, that ultimately we felt like would in some way make, make the world a better place. So we decided, screw it, we're gonna do it. So, we write a business plan. I worked at Panera for about a year. Um, we raise money, which is a miracle, um, and we actually open, okay? Our first restaurant, I don't know if you guys, I hope all you guys have been to Be Good. If you came in the early days, um, it was a much different experience. We were not good restaurant operators. Um, but what we were is we were very focused on improving the business, building relationships, and learning every single day. And we literally never left the restaurant for probably five years. Okay, so fast forward about 13 years when we wrote that business plan, and, and now we have a real business. So we're, we have 17 B Goods in six states. Uh, last Thursday, we opened actually in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, you know, by the end of the year, we're at a really interesting point in our business kind of uh, lifespan where we're at the finish line of a large uh, capital raise, uh, and at the same time, we have a really healthy pipeline of new stores. So landlords now are, are actually kind of coming to us, which first time in our history, that's we used to have to chase every single deal and, and beg our way in. Now we're kind of getting, we're getting people coming to us with the deal. So, you know, next year, and this is a real number, we're, we, we'll be at least 30. We have a bunch of leases signed in Ontario uh, to open in Canada. Um, we have, we're going to be in D.C. and we're going to push down into Connecticut. Uh, as well as we, we're going to open locally, we're going to be in the Seaport, Longwood, uh, and in Newton on Needham Street. Okay, so, so now let's talk about what Be Good is and what we do. Okay, so... Be Good makes real food. From the very beginning, from the first business plan, that's what we wanted to do. It's, it's all that it, that's all that we are here for. Um, now, the way we define real food has always been an evolution. When we started, we thought real food meant grind beef, cut potatoes, make homemade salads, and we're good. When you live in a restaurant and you really start learning and you immerse yourself in this, you realize that your definition of real is going to change. You start asking questions about where that food comes from. So, yeah, we're grinding steak, but where, where does that steak come from? If it's raised in a factory, is it still real? Once we started asking ourselves those questions, it really changed our business. And we continue to ask ourselves that question now. And I think in the last two years, we've, we've really changed our menu, we've broadened our focus, and we've, we've kind of pushed on that definition of real food, and we've seen the most success we've ever seen. So what, what our mission is now is, is, or the definition of real food is that it comes from farmers, it's made by people, and it's served by family. We use that mission to motivate ourselves. It's why I still love being a part of Be Good, because I believe that that mission is worthwhile. We use it to motivate our staff, and when we do it really well, and we do it right, and we deliver the, the food is great, the message is right, and the, and the experience is good in the store, we hopefully use that mission to inspire our, our customers. Um, now, to pull it off, we think we have to do three things. We have to make and serve real food, we have to act like real people, and we have to use people to tell the story of how our food is made, and last, we have to create this, what we call a real experience. So, most of these things that we're talking about, real food, real people, real experience, at the beginning was always juxtaposed against industrial fast food. So, you know, when we started, it was clear, like, McDonald's wasn't serving real food, it was from scientists and from factories. People, they were, the human touch was, was totally out of fast food, right? Like, you never, you never, they never celebrated the people that worked in the store, they would celebrate a dog that spoke Spanish and sold burritos and told jokes, right? And then the experience, it was, there was no emotion in, in fast food anymore, it was about, ubiquity and convenience and discounting and, and movie tie-ins, right? It wasn't, it wasn't about being a part of a community and trying to work together with customers to make something that they believe in and that we believe in. Okay, I'm going to show you guys a video which I hope ties all that, what I just talked about together. We started with this dream of making real food. We wanted to make food the right way to make it with pride, to make it with love, to make food the way Uncle Ferris made it for us when we were growing up. We were really young, 
So while we had the ideas and the heart to get this off the ground, we really didn't know what our business would have to become. From the start, we always believed that real food had to be made by people, not factories. But over time, we realized that there was more to real food than what we did in our restaurant every day. So we got to know the farmers and producers we wanted to work with. That's when we learned that we had to make this into something bigger. Well, when I was seven, I took a, a liking to growing things. I, my great-grandfather and grandfather were blacksmiths, but also had a farm. And that's been the family since 1894. Well, it's very satisfying when you uh, start put a seed in the ground, then wait and hope it comes up and see it's up and then nature it and then uh, be able to um, harvest it. And it makes me feel very good to see people come up and enjoy the farm and, and enjoy getting things that are being grown here. You know, people in the town, they all know us. They all know what we do. You know, I think they have a lot of respect for us. I can't imagine, I guess, doing anything else. Well, it's, it's the, you know, the responsibility of getting up and feeding the cattle every day. It's, it's the lifestyle. Well, I think people recognize how hard we work here, and uh, they're right. So I think the, the community recognizes that and uh, appreciates that. Uh, everyone should do something for society. That's what you're on this earth for, to do things to help out the uh, human race, making the world a better place. That's what makes it, I believe. You know, it's that responsibility. It's the law of it, I guess. Once it's in your blood, you can't get it out. We realized that we were part of something bigger than fresh local ingredients and wholesome, delicious food. We realized that real food is what connects a community. And those communities are built on people who dedicate their life's work to doing something good for others. So that means we have to be connected to the real people who grow, raise, and make real food. We need to know who they are, learn about their lives. We need to support them and support their values and principles. Every farmer we meet, every person who makes and brings real food to us, they all have this one unmistakable thing in common. They all do what they do because they want to spend their time on this planet doing something good, something that matters to their community. That's what we want to do too. Okay, so, um, so that touched on pretty much the three things that we care about, real food, real people, and real experience. So first and most importantly is this idea of real food. So again, we define it as food from farmers, made by people, served by family. Um, you know, we define real food as knowing where it comes from, or that's, that's an important element of it. So we try to source as much locally as we can. If you come to Be Good today, all our beef comes from a co-op up in Maine called Pineland Farms in New Gloucester. Our potatoes come from Swazlowski uh, Family Farms in Hatfield, Mass. Our ice cream is from Tuscanini's right here in Cambridge. Uh, you know, our, our, even our croutons are from bread that we cut from Iggy's. So um, to us, it's, we didn't go out to say we wanted to start or make, make fast food local. We said we wanted to make it real. To make it real means you have to know where it comes from and you have to build real relationships with the people who make it. Um, we also think it's, it's food with transparent ingredients and nutritional info. For us, we think of that as a competitive advantage. So we celebrate the fact that our, our uh, talking about our ingredients, talking about the farmers, talking about everything that's in the food. Um, we also, we, because real food comes from farmers, we think there has to be a seasonal component to it. So it has to be tied to local growing season. So there's one piece of our menu that rotates quarterly. So right now, if you go to Be Good, you can get a, a burger with local green chilies on it. You can get a side of local cauliflower. You can have an apple shake. Or you can have a kale and quinoa bowl with uh, fall apples from Hatfield, Mass, uh, and bacon from Vermont. Um, it, and we think, so now is where we start talking about how we've evolved a bit. So we think, we define real food as diversity, and diversity not just in how it's seasonal and how it changes quarterly, but more about we have the ability to pull from a broad spectrum of wholesome natural ingredients. We also think that consumer adoption and their relationship to real food is an evolution. So we think we have to stay innovative and take a leadership advantage to be thought leaders. So we want to own the category, so we want to be ahead. That's why we started cold pressing juice uh, a year ago. It's why we, you know, we had a kale smoothie a year ago, and why we've introduced these kale and chemo bowls. It's all about 
trying to move out of this perception of Be Good as being burgers, a burger place and more about this idea of Be Good being all about real food. Now, when we started, it was always about real food, but what we, what we thought is we thought we could connect quickly, easily, and emotionally with people by telling the story of the burger. So we always said, if we source our beef from local farms, we grind it in the restaurant, and we cook it, make it to order, you know everything that's in that burger, well, that is the epitome of real food, and that is the most powerful story we can communicate. It worked at the beginning, but then we realized a few years ago that that leading with that story definitely uh, it positioned us in a way that we didn't think we had the most upside and the most ability to really nail this idea of real food. And I'll take you guys through how the menu has evolved and how we've seen real, real increases since we've done that. Uh, and last and most importantly, real food is food that you feel good about. Okay? I'm going to show you guys another video. Uh, this one's about, I talked a little bit about where our potatoes come from. Uh, I'm going to show you guys, introduce you guys to Frank Swazowski. He's a, he's a legend and he's a friend and I, I, love, I love watching this. When I was growing up with my brothers, I was third oldest and, uh, you know, we all sort of worked together. We, we knew that that farm was our whole life because it was my father's whole life and my grandfather's. For some reason, we had it in our heads, our parents, that that farm was everything because we, uh, when my grandfather came over, he had nothing. He worked in a mill and then when he bought the first piece of land and my father worked, they just were growing potatoes and working hard, and my, uh, we, we were born to work. My mother did a really good job, and father, bringing the four of us up. Everybody would help everybody. And everybody respected my father and the JR. Of course, he was well respected, uh, and uh, it just grew. It's something that we, we just we lived for, growing potatoes. And uh, that was our whole life. Getting up in the morning, like this time of the year, in June, July, I get up at five, I get in my pickup and I ride. It takes me four or five hours to ride and check all the fields and see how they're growing. It's a beautiful, beautiful life. When you go down through the meadows early in the morning in, in, in this uh, countryside here, it's beautiful. I, and, and I just love it. I mean, uh, uh, that's why I'm 76. My brothers, they're all older. Two of them are older than me. And they love it. They love it. And they, they got pickups. They go around riding, checking. And uh, it, it's, it's in our blood. And we'll do that until the day we die, I'm sure. And what more do you want? What more do you want? Independent? You don't have to worry about this or that or you're on, not on time. Uh, it's quite a unique life, it really is, to be a farmer. Okay, so that's Frank. He grows our potatoes. I don't think you could watch that or get to know Frank and not want to eat our fries, right? And so, literally, to me at least, I, once you know Frank, you, you just, you believe in him and, and you want to support him. And so, when we think about the way we talk about real people, it's guys like Frank, okay? And, and to tell their stories, and not mess with the story and just tell it authentically and honestly, we think that's going to create the, commo the connection. So we, from the beginning, we've always thought that we needed to tell an unfiltered story about the people who make, raise, and grow real food. And it extends not just from farmers, but it's also to the guys and girls that work in our restaurants. So we've, we've even made celebrities out of uh, people beyond farmers. So I'm going to introduce you to a guy now. His name is Kekuto Manny. He is our first Be Good employee. So he started in Dartmouth Street 11 years ago. Um, and I can't talk about real people and not, not talk about Kakuto Manny. So hopefully you guys. This is machine. Come in, please. Fresh tomato, everyday cut tomato. Bacon, fresh bacon. And my meat over there. This is my machine. Every day uh, I bring meat. No, all meat. New meat. Be careful. Nice burger coming, people. <laughs> this is fresh burger. You know why? Because that's the best one. Now I started frying my meat. I finished car now. Nice. I only come to your house. Tell me why you come to your house. Because it's best burger. Best barbecue. <laughs> come on people, order now. 
Okay, so you understand real people. Manny's real. The last piece is this idea of, of having, making a real experience. You know, so I, I think, like I said before, we, we, we thought that industrial fast food had lost the human touch and people, there was no emotion left. So for us, when we started, it was always about, can we build a brand that is emotionally uh, connected through co-creation and participation? Okay? Now, we did this in ways that I would never recommend people do, and I'm going to take you through examples. We did some really crazy things, but I think what it did was it kind of hardwired in our DNA our commitment to go out to the community, do stuff with customers, and tell the story. Whether or not it's crazy and stupid, it didn't matter. Um, but to really build the experience, it's more than just being active, right? We think, we think first and foremost, you have to have a mission that people believe in, right? That, that's bigger than, food and, or bigger than the product and service you sell. We think people, if we do it right, people believe in, in, in support the idea of supporting guys like Frank Sozlowski, supporting guys like Bill Spiller, who was in that first video, right? Guys that spend their whole life, I mean, Bill's, what, 76? He spent his whole life working on a farm so that we could eat his, his food. Um, you know, I also think people believe in supporting a regional food economy, and they believe in eating food that is good for them, or good for their kids, or good for other people's kids. Um, so that, we think that's, that's critical. Uh, the other piece is what I talked about, community and uh, co-creation and participation. Uh, it, but it's also about making it so that partnership or being in the Be Good family enables you or makes it easy for you to do good in your own community. Now, that's really hard to do. Um, we've tried to do it with technology, and I'll, and I'll show you guys how we did it. Um, clearly, there's an element of personalization. To, to have emotion, you need to actually know people. You have to treat them uh, based on their unique identity. You have to know who they are. Uh, and then last is really the, the end game is all about if you do it right, you get dialogue, you get feedback, and you get loyalty. And I think in spots, we've done it really well. And there are, there are people, there's a subculture of crazy be good people, family members who, who love us, who do really strange things, and who I'm going to talk about next. Um, so I think of, of the three things, you guys clearly get the idea of real food, you get the idea of real people. I wanted to just focus a little bit about this real experience side because I think um, number one, I think you guys will get a kick out of it, but number two, I think there's actually there's some lessons in here, and I think we, we did this at the very beginning, so um, this, is, this is a crazy one. So we opened in January 2004. We're open for about 18 months. We decide we're going to buy an El Camino. Do you guys know what an El Camino is? Okay. This, is, this El Camino is special. Okay, so after 18 months, we, we're not making money at all. We're losing so much money, but we're so stupid, we think we're making money. So we decide we're going to go out and buy one. Okay, so we look on Craigslist. Now, we only have $1,800 to spend, so we find this thing. It was in Reading, okay? Didn't, didn't work, didn't start. But we found it. We got it towed to our mechanic. And all along the way, we're telling our family of customers about this. So we put out an email that doesn't have anything to do with food. It has to do with this pursuit of the El Camino. We find it. We then tell everybody how, how it doesn't work, how we're getting it fixed, but then we have a contest to name it. Okay, so it's all about getting people to be participants, right? So we have a contest, we get down to the finalists, we put it out to vote, our family picks the winner. They picked this guy named Dan Herbstman. His name was El Tio Superfly Clown Des Destroyer. We call our baby El Tio, okay? As a side note, Dan ended up being an investor in Be Good, so he didn't just name the car, he actually believed so much and became such an uh, ardent family member that he ended up, he and his dad ended up investing in our next restaurant that we opened. El Tio spends about three and a half years just dominating Boston and Cambridge. We had a restaurant in Harvard Square, so we would literally hope, and I drove it every day, we, I would hope when I had to go to Harvard that I could get it from Dartmouth Street to Harvard Square. I had to have the windows open the whole time because there were toxic fumes that came into the cabin and they would literally give you a migraine headache whenever you did it. So an interesting way to, uh, to connect with your community. El Tio, after we have it and we see the response, people love it, right? It becomes kind of like our, it becomes a sim symbol of like this entrepreneurial spirit that's at Be Good. So we have a contest for two years while Be Good's alive. Every fall, so you can't start El Tio in the winter. Doesn't, doesn't work. But in the spring, when it got above 60 degrees, you could actually start him. And we would put it out, we'd announce it was a big deal when El Tio started, the day it started. That was the first day of spring, we thought. So we would then ask people, our community, our family, we would say, guys, El Tio works. We're going to offer you this ability. We'll pick you up every day in the morning, drive you to work. We'll pick you up at night at your office. And then on the way home, when we're driving you home, we'll stop and buy uh, dinner for you and everybody you live with. 
people actually wanted to do this. Okay, we had tons of, I mean, remember we only had two restaurants. So tons of uh, engagement on this meant like you get 100 people to, to be interested. That's huge. So first two winners, the first guy, this is a crazy story, this guy Andy, he was our first winner. He actually fractured his hip in a skiing accident in the winter, so he couldn't walk, so he literally needed the ride. So we picked him up, I remember we picked him up in Somerville, drove him into Harvard Square, picked him up at night, drove him home. Um, the guy had a great sense of humor, uh, because obviously El Tio was, was different. Um, our next winner was this guy named Sammy, and I think Sammy was the ultimate. He, was, he caused the demise of El Tio. Sammy lived in Ipswich. Now we didn't ask, we didn't ask the geography of anybody who entered the contest. Sammy was down in Harvard Square for like this model UN thing. Love Be Good, became the family member, and he ended up winning. And once he won, we couldn't tell him we can't get to Ipswich. So we made it, I made the trip up. Uh, he actually had us drive him to his prom, which was, which was interesting. Um, but in the end, El Tio passed. Um, but along the way, we learned a lot. I know this is really strange, but we learned the importance of when you, when you do something, do it with your community of family. Like, treat your, treat your customers like family and tell them stories, right? Like, tell them stories like they're your, they're your friend. Okay, the next piece, and this is kind of the evolution of El Tio. So El Tio dies. We really have no money now. So I come up with this idea that sampling works, obviously. If you can be out in front of your restaurant and you can hand somebody a piece of real food that they can get excited about, that's a totally, that's a memorable experience, but the conversion on that is going to be high. So we came up with this idea to create what we called a shake cart. Now, this was a Rubbermaid cart right, like the one that we tried to get into this building that they wouldn't let us. Uh, we, we had our sign company cover it in aluminum with flames, and, you know, as a, as a tribute to LTO. And then we put car batteries on the bottom shelf, and we ran a Vitamix blender, the same one we have out here. And literally every day for about, probably about a year, I would push that cart before we opened every morning up and down Boylston Street, try to get people when they came out of the tea, give them a sample, tell them to come in for lunch, give them a coupon, um, and it worked. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is about community, not about sampling and conversion, but the way we did it was very much like LTO. So when we, when, we, when we decided we were gonna do the shake cart, we told the story to our customers. We had them name it. This woman named Kathy named it Terremoto because it was a shake cart, and Terremoto means earthquake in Spanish. She drinks free, free shakes and smoothies for life. <laughs> After two years, we realized sampling is powerful, right? And we always knew it. So we decided to do what we did with LTO. We decided we were gonna buy another vehicle. This was before food trucks. So we went down to Chelsea. We started meeting the, uh, the underground network of uh, ice cream truck drivers, which is a very scary subculture. <laughs> and we realized that ice cream trucks cost a lot of money. They cost like eight grand. We, that was way over our budget. So we started telling the story on Facebook. Now, Facebook back then, was we, we were active on it, but it wasn't, all that, uh, it wasn't as powerful as it is now. But one thing that did happen is that people started talking about it. And one of our customers, this guy named David Yaris, he actually wrote to us and said, guys, you're not going to believe this. My, I have an old box truck in the, my parents' backyard. He's like, I'm going to give it to you. So we try to cut him a deal to give him free food for life. He negotiates $1,000. We do the deal, and we buy this yellow uh, box truck. It's definitely not a food truck. It's, just a, it's like almost like a UPS truck. Have it towed because it doesn't work. We tell the story. We have a guy name it. So this guy, Derek, he named it Harvey. Um, he gets free milkshakes for life. We tell the story on our truck, so we tell you why it's Harvey. Derek's name is on there. And now we have an actual vehicle that we can drive around the city, do the same thing, play music, give samples out, and most importantly, activate people into our family. So, you know, we have iPads where we can either activate a keychain and you're enrolled, or you can download an app and participate. And now we have 70,000 family members, you know, and our engagement is high because this is the stuff that we've always done and this is the stuff that we need to continue to do. Okay, a couple more quick ones. And they continue to get more and more weird. So this is, now the reason why I have this up here is because I think once you establish your brand as being community based and that you're creative and, and, and you really just, you just want to have fun, I think your relationship with your customers change, right? They, they engage in you, with you in really strange things, things that aren't about business transactions. This guy named Toby back in 2007, he was running the Boston Marathon, he was almost ready to, uh, it was almost the marathon. I think it was like, what was it, April or March? And he, he wrote us an email. He said, guys, I need to raise $2,000. My fundraising isn't going well. I feel like I come all the time, and I know you guys are the type of business that you might want to do this. He said, if you help me raise $2,000, I'll wear a hamburger suit in the Boston Marathon. <laughs> I was like, 
you know, I said, uh, I, I thank the Lord for that one. So I said, absolutely. We write them right back. We're like, we're on it right now. My, in a very odd, karmic, uh, I don't know, it's like my manifest destiny for this to happen. My parents own a, a, a fabric store in Dorchester. So he came to the right place. We had the fabric. My mom sewed, my, my mom's an incredible sewer, so we were able to crank that burger suit out in literally like a day. So when we write to this kid, we're like, Toby, yep, we got you. It's all ready. Come out of the restaurant. So Toby's, he's in it. We start raising money. He drops out two weeks before the marathon. But we have this family of customers, and we always tell stories and do strange things. So we put it in an email at the end of an email that we're, talking, we're telling people about like our new burger. And in the PS line, we say, hey, guys, nobody's going to want to do this, but we actually have a burger suit. This guy Toby backed out. Does anybody want to run the marathon in our burger suit? I don't know why anybody wanted to do it. We got over 30 replies saying they wanted to do it. Okay, doesn't make sense. So we decided we were going to go with the first guy that wrote this guy named John Koss. He was an attorney, like a big wig attorney at uh, I forget what firm. He decides he's going to do it. He, we 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 don't know. We don't ask why. He just does it. We help him raise a little bit of money for the American Liver Foundation. He's running the marathon. This kid named Sam Novi's running alongside him. Asks him. He says, oh, I love Be Good. How, how did you get to do that? And John says, well, you should just email the guys. They're, they'll be psyched. So the next year, Sam takes the throne. And he changes, he changes everything. So he creates a persona around this thing called Burger Man. He raises $20,000. Okay? And then we do it together. So we support him. He raises $20,000. We co-teach a class at Citizen Schools, which is an after-school program in uh, kind of like the inner city. Um, but he's able to raise $20,000. And then with the momentum he built, the next year, we have 24, so he went to Harvard, we have 24 Harvard students lining up to run the next year's Boston Marathon. Now, we, we don't have numbers. There's no reason why people would, would want to do this, other than they feel like connected to Be Good and they want to do something positive in their community and raise money. So three years later, we had 72 running burgers in the marathon, okay? We raised $90,000 for local charities. So we did Back on My Feet was a recipient, um, and like I said, Citizen Schools. And then about a year and a half ago, we started to, I actually ran the marathon in a burger suit myself, so um, I felt like that was the necessary thing. Um, so, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, we decided, why, why, should, why should Anthony and I, why, why do we get the $20,000, $25,000, and then decide where to, who to give it to? So we, we formalized our foundation. We made it a 501c3. So now anytime we raise money uh, at Be Good, we give it back, but we do it in a really cool way. So um, first of all, it's 100% of every cent we raise goes back out, but we do it uh, in a way that we, we solicit grants. So we do a quarterly grant series where we hopefully find individuals who are inspired to do things in their community. Now, it's great to support large uh, philanthropic institutions, but for us, we want to find people within our customer base who have a great idea. You know, and, and we're a public charity, so we can write a check to, we can write a check to anybody. Um, and then what we do, and this is kind of where it, it fits into how we do all our stuff, is that we let, our, we let our family decide where the money goes. So we have a board that selects top three every quarter, and then we put it out to vote. The person with the most votes gets the check. Um, so to date, we have eight microgrants issued and $34,000. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. So la last one, because I, I think that we're, uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting slowed down here. Um, so then this last piece is, and this is a more recent example, and I, I, think this is, I think this is interesting, and I think this is something that I wish more companies would do, and I wish more customers would, uh, would participate with us on things like this. Um, because actually, and when you think about it, it's an investment that we're already putting out there, but it just simply goes to somebody that, that needs it more. So we were lucky enough, we won Small Business of the Year a couple, we uh, a couple weeks ago, we were awarded at Boston Small Business of the Year. Um, you know, in a piece, a reason why we won it is because of, you know, community social corporate social responsibility and the things we do to try to help others. Um, so when we won the award, we wanted to celebrate it with our family. So we put an email out with the video that they made for us, and we sent it to every single family member who had ever visited us in Boston. So it's 40,000 people. But we, the message was about, it wasn't about our award. It was about the award, but it was about, hey, we got this because you guys have supported us and because we've done cool things together. So let's do one more thing. So what we decided to do is we decided to put a free uh, product on every single person's app. So 40,000 freebies. And we didn't tell people what it was. It was burgers, kale and chemo bowls, smoothies, you name it. But there were two things you could do with it. The first thing you could do is you could walk into Be Good, any Be Good, and you could eat your freebie, or you could donate it. So we've had this, pro uh, this pilot program in place for almost a year where anytime you get a, a, a product from Be Good, you can always redeem it, you can always share it with others, or you can, or you can donate it. For us in Boston, we've partnered with the Mather Elementary School in Dorchester. So on this promotion, we got 865 people walked into Be Good on Thursday, October 7th, 
and they ate a freebie. But we got 885 people who donated to the Mather. Now, the, the way we followed up on that is that a week and a half later, which was last Thursday, we went to the Mather. We took over the cafeteria, and they have 800 students, so we made 800 burgers, and we made 800 green smoothies, and we fed every single student and every, and every single teacher. And then I think that's great, right? But then we followed up with our customers, sent them a thank you note, and we sent them this video so that they could see where their donation went. Okay, we're just finished up at the Mather Elementary School in Dorchester. We cooked 800 burgers. We made 800 green smoothies. We fed 800 students and faculty, and we were able to do it because of the donations from our Be Good family members. Please keep donating. We want to come back. Antonia works at the Mather. What do you think, Antonia? Oh, I love I love this school. This is my best friend's school. Thank you for everything you do every year. Hey. Hey. Okay. <laughs> that got weird at the end. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I really want to open it up for questions. So I'm going to try to breeze through this, and then hopefully, I hope you guys have questions at the end. I always measure a good presentation based on if people uh, actually ha want to talk to me. Um, all right, so just to, just to go back to what we're all about, you know, I think this is a good point for, for me to focus on this evolution of our brand and, and really where we want to take this kind of positioning about real food. So we think if we can do it right, we could, we could potentially be a leader in this category of real food. There, you know, Chipotle does a great job with food with integrity, but it's a burrito place. Sweetgreen does an incredible job, but it's a salad place. Nobody has taken this whole food approach, which is more holistic and philosophical, and said, hey, we want to do something with food, community, and your environment, right? And so we think this is where uh, the real success is going to come over the next couple years. Um, and, you know, here there's a, there's a quote with, by Michael Pollan, who I just think sums it up, and, and this kind of summarizes real food, where, you know, I think the food we've eaten, and I think everybody here understands it, but it's been compromised and it's been changed. And if, if we can just get back to eating the food that our great-grandparents ate, uh, we'd all be doing a lot better. Um, okay, so this is from Q1 of, two, of this year. So what we saw is that about two years ago, we decided we had to get away from this identity as being a burger place. Um, we weren't going to win, and, and people, if you came in to be good for a burger, you, you could get it, but you can get a, Five Guys makes a great burger, right? But we, need, we were trying to do something else, so we needed to reinforce it with different products and different messages. Um, so we ran this at Q1. So about two years ago, we, institute, we introduced that kale crush smoothie to our menu. When we did that, that was kind of the, the entree to understanding that our customers were ready to adopt uh, a more explicitly healthy product and, and really forced us to kind of start going down this path. And, and really the breakthrough product for us was these kale and quinoa bowls. So right now we serve, or in Q1, and these numbers have risen tremendously. So if we ran it for Q2, I bet, I bet salads are at 15% and I bet kale and quinoa bowls are at 20% of sales. Our number one seller at all our restaurants is a spicy avocado and lime kale and quinoa bowl. Um, you see burgers are meaningful, right? And they still are, but they're, they increasingly are, are uh, a shrinking category. Turkey and chicken, veggie burgers. Um, we sell a lot of sides, right? So we sell fries that we, uh, we finish in an oven, sweet potato fries, and we have a side of veggies, and we also have a rotating seasonal side of veggies. We also have smoothies, which is really a great way to, I think, bridge that kind of identity as real food. So having a green smoothie, we have three green smoothies now. Um, we also have cold-pressed juice. And I just think there are certain products that, that you can just nail and it just really changes uh, the positioning of the brand and the way people relate to it. So as we've evolved the menu, we also have realized we need to evolve the experience. Um, you know, I, this is something I think about a lot. We, when we started Be Good, it was, we were just trying to, we were bootstrapping it. We just wanted to get the restaurants open and we just wanted to do it as cheaply as we could. We didn't want to raise money. We already, we already have raised so much money, right? And every time you raise money, you're giving away equity. So we did it as cheaply as we could. And now we look back and we kick ourselves, right? Because so much of telling the story of real food happens in your four walls, and you, you need to be able to provide visual cues and every single thing that happens in your restaurant. That has to go back to the real food, to that definition of real food. We, we didn't do that, and we're trying to do it now, but you know, we've identified what it needs to mean. So when you come to Be Good, you're supposed to, you're supposed to feel these things. You're supposed to feel like it's honesty. I don't know how you feel that, but you're supposed to, that you, somehow it's supposed to just wash over you. Um, you're supposed to know the food's local, right? You're supposed to know the people that make it. You're supposed to have this idea of farm to table, uh, what is it? casual, open kitchen, food is the star. And so we've started to go back into our stores and retrofit them slightly. So we've given them some upgrades. So we're using reclaimed wood. We're using, um, you know, great photography of the real, like, 
Frank Slazowski's in our restaurants. Um, you know, we've, we've upgraded the furniture. We grow a lot of stuff. So we grow at restaurants. We grow on the roof. We grow out back. But people didn't, the people that love Be Good knew about it. So we needed to somehow bring that inside. So it, at our new restaurants, a lot of times we'll grow mint or we'll grow basil. Um, and then another visual cue that's been really effective at New Be Good is that the kitchen, more and more we need to make the kitchen completely transparent. So getting stuff out of the walk-in and putting it out for people to see it. So um, you know, we have these reach-in coolers. You don't see them in Boston, unfortunately. But at Newbie Goods, you see a, a cooler that merchandises all of our produce, just like at Whole Foods, or even sometimes our cheese, uh, with blackboards that tell you what's actually seasonal and where things come from. Uh, we've updated our sign package to make sure that uh, the stories are in the community piece is still being told. You know, I think, uh, so we're going to open in Toronto in December. And this is, this is an idea of kind of the new prototype. You know, this... Some of these elements are consistent with what we do. Some are different, but we, we know that we know what we need to become, and we're trying we're trying hard to, to get us there. Um, and finally, this is this is the last slide. So the, the finally, it's you know we think if we put all these things together, so the idea of real food is good, right? Somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to nail this. You know, so our idea is good. Our execution is pretty good. Um, now it's 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 holding on to that idea of building community, connecting with customers. Uh, figuring out the design, uh, just doing a great job with the messaging and the positioning. And we think if we can nail it and do it well, that we're going to be kind of in a category that's ours alone. Now, there's a lot of people that will try to enter that category. Um, but the, the, I think one of the advantages of Be Good is that we've never been called Be Good Burgers. We've never been Be Good Pizza, right? I think we hopefully can uh, tell this story of real food and, and hit this message right so that we're the first mover and that we're the category leader. And I think if we do, we'll have a lot more restaurants. So that's it. Thank you, guys. So I'm hoping there's some questions. Hi, Brian Donovan from uh, Allen and Garrettson. Um, with the uh, rapid expansion that you have uh, and the local sourcing being such an important element, how much is that in the character of the people that you're actually working with? How much does that play into it? For example, opening up in Raleigh, you know, do you evaluate not only the market and the demand for this product, but also the sourcing element is pretty huge, it seems. Yeah, it's funny. I think so. The, from the outside, the, 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 uh, the biggest obstacle everybody thinks we face is how do you make local scalable? And, and what we've seen is it gets easier. So New England is hard. Toronto is extremely hard. Right? They have, their growing season is like three months. In Raleigh, I mean, Raleigh is the greatest be good that you could have. I mean, everything is sourced within, seriously, 20 miles of the restaurant. It's, it's incredible. Sweet, I mean, and, and the process is, is awesome. So the way it works is we set up their supply chain, um, and then we go down and we evaluate the farmers. We meet the farmers. So, and I get to do that, which is, is really one of the most fun parts of my job. So I've met, you know, I've met the guy that makes the cheese down in Raleigh. I've, met, um, I've been to the sweet potato farm. I've been to the, the, you know, the, the beef farmer. Um, so I, I don't think it, it seems like that's the biggest obstacle, but, it, it, but it's truly not. The supply chain is there. It's just a matter of if you're willing to think outside the box and if, you're not, if, you, don't, if you feel like you don't need to comply with uh, buying everything from Cisco or from one, what they call it in the industry is broadline distributors. So, you know, typically... You want to make this thing as easy as possible. So you call, Cisco brings everything to your door. Now we use U.S. food, so we use a broadliner. But we now have the purchasing power where we can force U.S. foods to go out and actually go to Toscanini's, which is pretty incredible. Like Toscanini's is one, they have one ice cream shop. Toscanini's makes tubs of their vanilla, and then U.S. foods picks it up, brings it to their warehouse, and then they redistribute it to be good for us. So it's not easy. And it's not, you, you can't do it out of the gate. Like, we never would have been able to do this year one. But I think with scale comes the ability, if you stay true to what your real vision is, you can, you can do, make some change and you can do some good stuff. Um, so I, I do think supply chain, it's, it's what everybody thinks is going to be kind of the, the stumbling block for Be Good. And I think it's less about the supply chain. I think it's more about the culture and the people and the training and, and if we're smart about the way we grow, you know. Hi, uh, John Trinanis from George P. Johnson. I, uh, so part of your DNA, it's really nice, it's authentic, that you make these great connections with your customers where they, they become family. And you have this really aggressive uh, growth plan coming on, right? How do, you, how do you keep it authentic when you're making, you personally, John, are making these connections with your customers and you're turning them into family members. 
as you grow, what's the plan to keep that authenticity from one zone, one part of the country, like up in Toronto? I mean, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. How do you connect with those people? Yeah, I mean, that's... that's you got to hire like 20 Johns. I wish I, wish I knew the secret, man. I, I, I think that, that is truly, that, I think that is the biggest challenge. It's not, it's not John, but it's how do we transport the culture? How do we build relationships? How do we have that same love for community and for our customers? And I think one thing we've learned and we've learned this the hard way, is we, we really only hire from within. So our GMs, if you're going to run a Be Good store, if you're going to be a district manager, you, need, you, you have worked in the trenches and come up through the system because your relationship to Be Good is so different. I mean, we've hired people from outside and brought them in. It never works. Um, but I do think in terms of like the emotional connection to customers, I think you, gotta, you, gotta, you need to bring, bring people up through your culture and, and bring them to Toronto, which we have done. So our, our director of operations for Canada. It's crazy. He, he actually grew up with Anthony and I, um, and he, he's worked at Be Good for years. Uh, so we, we feel like we have a unique opportunity there. But I do think technology is kind of, is, is another piece of it. So, you know, in Canada, they already bought their Harvey, right? So they're using the things that we do. We, 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 we force them to do the same kind of organic, street-level, hand-to-hand stuff. So they own Harvey. They have a family system. They've gone out and created their own community partner, Okay, so they have a relationship with this, uh, this huge food bank up in Toronto. And, uh, and, and so really, the, I think the tools are in place, but it's going to come down to the, the people that actually are running it and doing it every day. So I think like any business, it's training and hiring and, and all that stuff. But I do, I, I do agree. It's, it's, it, is, it is tricky. And I think everybody in here knows you, there are brands that you love and that are so authentic. And then all of a sudden, one day, they just things change and that whole human kind of element is gone. And I, I think once you lose it, it's you kind of it's kind of that point of no return. So something we're always thinking about. John, um, so a lot of the um, fun family ideas and programs that you've had seem to have been a combination of your own creativity and also some crowdsourcing. Have you ever had any people bring ideas to you that you had to say they're so crazy we can't even do them? Anything fun you'd like to share with us? Oh, man. I think we've, this is crazy, but I think we've tried. If we haven't tried everything, we've definitely considered it. I wish I, I mean, I can tell you a really crazy story. Uh, so we had a restaurant in Brookline. It was, it struggled. It was, it was, it wasn't on one of the slides, it, but it forced us to do some really, I mean, the things we've done are, are nuts, but we did even crazier things. Like, for instance, in Brookline, um, we needed to get out in the community, and so, we learned that in the Brookline schools, people were in, uh, they had, I forget the pizza place, but they were ordering pizza to feed the kids. And so we figured what better way to get in front of the town of Brookline than to feed all the kids. So we went to the school, we told the administrators, we're going to come and set up a grill. We're just going to feed your students for free. We did that. They let us do that. So we set up in the courtyard. We served like 500 students. We were just serving burgers at lunchtime for free. I don't, I, it was odd that they let us do this. We did it again. They let us come back the next Tuesday. We do it again. We do it again. It never rains. They say you can keep coming on Tuesday if it doesn't rain. It doesn't rain. After like six weeks, every kid is not, they're not eating in the cafeteria anymore. They, and, and next thing we know, town of Brookline says you guys have to move it indoors. We formalized the agreement and we actually started serving school lunches to kids in Brookline. It didn't actually work. I mean, it worked, it worked from, a, from a standpoint of we learned a ton and we know how to connect with uh, parents and students in towns. Um, it didn't save our business there by any stretch, but I do think that was an example of something that uh, came kind of from the outside, but we pursued. We also, we've been invited, like this is a really terrible story, but we were invited to go to a frat house party at BU. So this is in those dark days of, of Harvard, of, uh, of Harvard Street in Brookline, just doing whatever it took. And I remember driving LTO, I took a kid, and we go into one of those, those uh, frat houses in the basement. And it's like 1 in the morning. And I'm sitting there making mango smoothies. And I'm way too old to do this. I'm like 27, 28 years old. And I'm sitting there making mango smoothies for these kids. And they're like, I mean, they're just gonzo. Um, so I would say we've done, some, we've done everything. I don't think there's anything we haven't done. And I don't think if, if, if it's a good idea, we're going to go after it. So. You know, I think 
so we have a network of farmers, so we're insulated a little bit. But I also think, if, if you guys have ever met a farmer, these guys don't, they don't raise prices. I, I don't, someone that needs to like, someone needs to help these guys, like market, and I'm serious. Like, I, but they're so incredible, they're so endearing, but I, they, they don't raise prices, which is odd. I mean, I think for sure, one thing we've seen is the beef prices have escalated. I mean, we're at an all-time high for local beef. And so, rather than go out and find other vendors, which we did a year ago, we actually started sourcing from Vermont. Um, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't as good quality. And I, and I went to slaughterhouses and met all the farmers and everything. But it wasn't the same. So we, we pulled it back. And what we did is we raised prices. So our burgers went from, we've actually raised prices across the board. And, and, and it, people don't push back at all. And I think uh, that's a beautiful thing. And that, that protects you from, from terminating relationships with people that you care about. As long as your customers care about the same thing and are willing to pay 20 cents more, 30 cents more. You know, like our burgers, we raised, we raised it 40 cents. And literally, we think people aren't going to come. And then we put the menu boards up and nobody says anything. So um, I think we would, we, we, we definitely are, we're smart business people. So we, we, we're not going to continue to pay people that raise prices perpetually. But we understand what they're going through. And if, and if it comes down to it, we're going to save the relationship and see if our customers would pay a little bit more. OK. Oh. Uh, with aggressive scaling. Um, is franchising at all on the radar? It, it seems like it would probably be further out, uh, but. Yeah, so that's a good question. So we have franchised. So, um, and you know, I think it's been an interesting experience. So the, the beauty of franchising is you, you can open stores with other people's money. So you don't have to raise capital, so you don't give away, you're not diluted. And so a few years ago, um, Anthony and I hit a point where we needed to grow the business. We wanted to grow the business, but we, we didn't want to raise millions of dollars because we would have got crushed. So. We pursued it, and we've done it, and we've done it with five, we have five of our 17 are franchised. Um, so like Raleigh, North Carolina is franchised. So it's great on paper. It's, it's a hard model, and it's hard to build a human brand that you know, faces those challenges about what we're talking about in Canada. Um, it, it's, a, it's a different game. So what we've done is we've decided to, to focus on corporate growth. So this, this next round of capital that we're bringing in, it's going to be two open stores that we run, that we staff, that we build. Um, but I think the one great thing about franchising is that, um, is that it forces you to build systems that allow you to grow your business. Because you need to literally like hand somebody a blueprint for how do you run a Be Good. And while a lot of that knowledge was in our head, when you, when you, really, when you create a partnership where you're going to sell a franchise, you have to document everything. So that made us a better business, and it's given us the ability now to get out there and really open stores, because we can open stores quickly now. Um, so I think it's, it, it's been a blessing and a curse in some regard. I mean, all our franchisees are happy. They do well. But I think the way we think about it is that corporate is, corporate is there's advantages to corporate. Um, what's it like with the entrepreneurial dreamers out there? Oh, my advice is go for it. I mean, it's the best. You know, like I think. I got to do, my last 10 years of my life, I mean, I got to do some of the coolest things in the world. Like, all that crazy stuff, like, it seemed, I'm, I'm sure some people wouldn't like doing that. I, I think it's the best. I mean, I love, I love trying to build community and, and do this stuff. And, and, I mean, when you start your own thing, nobody tells you. you don't, I don't have a boss that says, hey, don't buy an El Camino, right? So, I mean, if I did, we wouldn't have had an El Camino. Um, but I, I would say I always encourage people to do it. And I, even if you fail, it doesn't matter. You become a better person. You become better business person and, and you just changes your life. I'm, I'm Fritz from Visual Dialogue and I play basketball with John and he's an amazing <laughs> basketball player. Oh, yeah. um, but I did have a question. Um, are there any examples of um, places nationally or internationally that you kind of admire and look to for their branding, for their interiors, for their marketing, whatever? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think when, when we were getting started, there, we, all, I always, we always had models, right? So Starbucks, I know they're ubiquitous and, and maybe they've sold out, but Howard Schultz, his story, if you read his book, Pour Your Heart Into It, he, he is just, he's the man. So um, the way they did it, the way they always put people first, the way they always thought about the third place and creating an experience, that was always hugely influential. There's a drink company that I always loved, which is called Innocent Drinks in the UK. Um, if you guys don't know it, it's different now because Coke bought it. But back in the day, their story is kind of like Be Good. And I met those guys, and, and the way that they built community was, was they provided in some ways a roadmap. I and mean, we did totally different things, but um, just their, their tone and the authenticity of that brand was special. You know, I think Whole Foods is great. I think Chipotle is great. I think Sweetgreen's great. I think 
Um, I also think there's one weird place that I, I find inspiration a little bit, and that's like, alternatively, so like, if you ever really look at like skateboard companies and surf companies that are founder run, they are, it, it's like the most authentic kind of expression of brands, and I think it's because it's surfers or skaters who do it. And I think when, when the people that build it or make it, when they're, the, when they're the people telling the story, I think that's different. And I think you, at least I can, I can sense it, and I think that's kind of where we always want to be good. We always want to have that kind of authenticity to what we do. So that's, where, that's kind of where we get it from. As more and more QSR brands and fast casual brands come into that space and start to do more of the things that you guys do, it feels like the food you guys can continue to win on, but they, they seem to be doing even more of the mission stuff that you're doing as well. How hard do you think that's going to be for you to continue to be a differentiated brand with the, the mission that you have versus the food? You know, I, that's a great question. I think if we build real relationships with farmers and we build real relationships with our community, then everybody wins. And I think if those guys do it, then the whole nature of, I think, business and consumer relationships, I think it's, it's good for everybody. So I, I don't know if it's a competition. I, I, hope, I hope what we do and what, you know, Panera has an incredible foundation. They do Panera Cares. And, and I, it's funny, I think I see Panera changing uh, their menus quickly. Like, so they have a green smoothie now and they're doing kale salads. And I think eventually they're going to, that, that bakery case that you see when you walk in, I think that, that's, while it's all, that's, that's core, I think that's going to start to shift. So I feel like everybody's in a rush to get to that middle place where we are. And, and that slide's kind of stupid that I put up because, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's real, but, but everybody is trying to get into that, that thing, which is like feel-good food that has a positive impact on community and that makes you feel good about what you're eating and where you're bringing your kids and all that stuff. And I think it's, as a customer of all those things, I think it's, I'm such a huge supporter of everybody going that route. I think for us, I think we have a different, I think for us it's different because like when we started it was, that was what we did. And so we, for, if you really dig in to be good, I think you see it as being, maybe, maybe you see it as being more real. So maybe that would be the advantage, but it's a good question. We have time. This will be the last question. Oh man, Uncle Ferris would be so proud. So Uncle Ferris passed away about four years ago. He, um, but he was, I didn't tell you guys about Uncle Ferris, so I'll make this quick, because I know everybody wants to go. But um, we, so Uncle, Uncle Ferris was kind of the personification of what Bigo was. So after school every day, Anthony and I would go home, and Uncle Ferris was retired. He lived in Anthony's parents' basement. He was a total crazy guy. Um, but he used to work at Stop and Shop. He was like a grocery buyer, so he, he, was, like, he was like a food guy. Um, and his whole day started when we got home from school where he could cook for us and everybody in the neighborhood. Um, and so when we decided to do this, you know, we made Ferris kind of like, he was kind of like our compass in terms of like, what is real food? It's food made by love by people. It's not sophisticated, it's, but it's, you, 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 if, if Ferris made us something, he did it the right way because he loved us. Um, but also he was so real, like he would, his day, he loved playing pranks on me. So he would prank call me, he would like make up terrible nicknames for me. And, just whatever he could do to get under my skin, he would do it. But, and he also was crazy. So he was, he, was, he was gambling all the time. He was smoking cigarettes. He was like always swearing. But for us, it was like, that is so real. That's a real person. It's like Frank, the farmer, right? Like Frank smoking a cigar and he's like, he's like I don't know, who knows what he does. But, but, putting, but, but making sure that we're not afraid to be different and to put true, real people out front, um, that was what, Ferris epitomized, and I think he would be really proud. The, the best thing that, Fer that happened to Ferris was that our first year in business, we had somebody get our newsletter who I, I think they were probably like, they, they, they couldn't figure out what we were doing, but then they, they really loved Vigo. They came in, and the woman ended up working for the Red Sox, and they had a cancellation. This is the year they won the World Series, our first year in business, and they asked Ferris to throw the first pitch out for a Red Sox game, and so we got to go out to the mound. They played the Texas Rangers in July, I think it was July 11th, guy throws the first pitch and he had been a Red Sox fan his whole life so you know he passed away I think two years after that but um, he, he loved it and I, I think he's smiling down on us now so it's great thank you guys